Hello, I'm Dr. Crystal Mercia for Contemporary Pediatrics. The topic of today's discussion is enterovirus E68. Joining me is Dr. Mary Ann Jackson, Division Director in Infectious Disease at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City and Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Missouri Kansas City School of Medicine. Dr. Jackson, enterovirus D68 is not something that's a new entity. Why has it recently moved to the top of pediatricians' radar? So enteroviruses are common viruses. Every pediatrician knows about them. They recognize summer as being the season for viral meningitis and hand, foot, and mouth disease. What's different about this virus, which was first described in the 1960s, is that this is the first large-scale national outbreak that we've seen of this disease, and it produced significant uh, morbidity in our patient population. So once it was first identified as causing unusually severe respiratory tract infection in children, it really was under the radar for over three decades before this year and in our institution first noted in August. So as we enter cold and flu season, pediatricians can expect to see quite a few cases of respiratory tract infections what symptoms should they be on the lookout for, and what groups of patients are the most at risk? So here's what's important about EDD68 compared to other respiratory viruses. So first off, this is an enterovirus. The expected seasonality of it would be like other enteroviruses, to start in summer, usually late summer, and go into the early fall. We usually see it disappear with Halloween, and uh, that's a good thing because it's basically indistinguishable from certain other viruses, particularly rhinoviruses. So when we first saw clinical disease with respiratory tract infection in children in our community, it looked like it had a predilection for school-age children, particularly those with asthma or history of prior wheezing, causing especially severe asthma attacks that were difficult to break and this actually bogged down our emergency room. In some cases, they were having extended visits with continuous albuterol requirements before getting admitted to either the PICU uh, with respiratory failure or to our wards. Uh, we saw a peak of disease, though, in my community that looked like it peaked into the end of August, the beginning of September, and then our curve slowly came down. Now, interestingly enough, at this point, we're seeing an increase in detection of these rhinoenteroviruses. And remember, the methodology that's used at most places across the country doesn't tell you, yes, it's a rhinovirus, yes, it's enterovirus D68. Um, but certainly, it looks like we're seeing a recrudescence of a virus at this point, which is likely rhinovirus. Now, clinically, does this make any difference? No, what we wanna do is be able to differentiate rhinovirus, common cold virus, from ED D68 from influenza. And I think there are some tips that we can give to practitioners. So number one uh, would be that influenza has high fever and systemic symptoms at onset with often headache and severe myalgia. In contrast, both rhinoviruses and enterovirus D68 have more nonspecific upper respiratory tract symptomatology, including sore throat, congestion, and cough, without generally high fevers at the outset. Rhinoviruses and enterovirus D68 both seem to have a predilection uh, for children with asthma and can cause severe asthma exacerbations. And in fact, influenza, we know, has an increased predilection for children with asthma. They are our, uh, one of our high-risk group patients. Uh, in terms of treatment and prevention, for influenza, we have uh, a way to identify and then identify who to treat with oseltamivir, and we have influenza vaccine. So for protect practitioners right now, real focus on getting influenza vaccine to your patient and recognizing the difference between viruses like rhino and enterovirus D68 in influenza at this point. So you had mentioned about the nonspecific nature of the typical testing, but there is a more rapid test that has come out. Can you tell us a little bit about that? 
Yes, and so the CDC did make available uh, primers for more specific testing for EBD 68. Many institutions have access to this, but you're not going to have access to this in your uh, private practice in, in community clinics that treat children. So that's a little bit uh, of a, a barrier, for instance, to being easily able to differentiate EBD 68 from rhinovirus right here and now. But it is completely correct that our initial um, multiplex PCR, with it, which most people use the same test across children's uh, hospitals across the country, they usually use this multiplex with which detects 20 different respiratory agents. They usually targeted children who are being admitted to the hospital because this test is more expensive than simple, simple rapid testing. And uh, that is the test that did not differentiate well between enteroviruses and rhinoviruses. Now we have more specific testing where we may be able to say, yes, it's, it's enterovirus D68, or no, in which case it can be any number of another virus. We mentioned rhinoviruses just because they're common this time of year, and they look like enterovirus D68, but so does parainfluenza, so does adenovirus, and those are two viruses that in my community we're uh, seeing now at the same time we're seeing uh, other viral disease. There's been some speculation regarding a link between enterovirus D68 and a polio-like illness that was reported in a small number of children in California and muscle paralysis that has recently been observed in Denver. Have there been any further connections made between enterovirus D68 and paralysis? So there is a CDC working group that's tackling this neurologic illness at this point. We've established a case definition, and the case definition is acute onset of limb weakness in a child who is, generally speaking, under 21 years of age and occurring since August of this year. To pair with this, that patient would have to have MRI findings with abnormalities that are generally restricted to gray matter. That's the case definition. Thus far, there have been, at this point, 57 cases reported across the country to the CDC of children who meet this case definition. And so we do want practitioners to be alert to this potential diagnosis. The reason the MRI is part of the case definition is that's what distinguishes this neurologic presentation from more common presentations that we see of uh, transverse myelitis, for instance, or Guillain-Barre syndrome are the two other neurologic uh, diseases that basically are often post-infectious in nature, and the concern is that this acute polio-like presentation, which they're going to be calling acute flaccid myelitis, which shows these gray matter findings uh, on MRI, is distinctively different and possibly related to neural invasion from virus as opposed to an immunologic phenomenon that we see, say, for instance, with transverse myelitis and Guillain-Barre. So extremely, extremely important that practitioners know what we are talking about, understand how to differentiate, and then are reporting to the CDC if they see cases like this. In any case where you see a child with acute limb weakness, who you then refer and uh, have a pediatric neurologist and a pediatric ID doctor who confirm these unusual and very specific gray matter abnormalities, these cases should be reported to the CDC. Well, thank you, Dr. Jackson, for joining me today. This has been Dr. Crystal Garcia for Contemporary Pediatrics.